nice to be with you again this evening. We appreciate your presence here. I was whispering to the pastor talking about those exit signs, <laughs> and I thought it would be an apropos thing to uh, suggest that you needed a fast exit from the preaching <laughs> <laughs> to show you how to get out. But no one has left yet, and we're glad. We appreciate your kindness and your graciousness. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. I should like to read two verses. The last two verses of that chapter, verses 20 and 21. You'll recognize, of course, that the Apostle Paul is doing the talking. And I rather think that he is not being just nonchalant and off-handed when he says what he's saying. Even though we believe that he was writing this, if he had been addressing himself to a public congregation, I am quite sure that his words would have been most emphatic. For he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And I think those words are so momentous that he never would have spoken them in a monotone. I think he would have gathered all of the impact of his intellect and all of his emotional capability, and he would have injected as much power and strength into that declaration as possible. For those words carry a tremendous impact, a tremendous weight of meaning. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And this first phrase of that 21st verse has spoken volumes to me. The Apostle says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. And as I look back over my ministry, as I attempt to analyze my preaching, I wonder if I can say that. Pastor, can we stand and say that we do not frustrate the grace of God? I hope under God that that can be said of my ministry. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The first part of that 20th verse serves as a springboard for our thinking tonight. I am crucified with Christ. Christ died on the cross that we might be saved from the cross. This is the excluding and judicial side of his death. This is the release, the glorious emancipation that has been provided by Golgotha. Not only did Christ die on the cross, that we might be saved from the cross, but here now develops a seeming paradox. Christ also died on the cross in order that he, we, might come on the cross together with him. It doesn't match, does it? It doesn't seem to add up. On the one hand, he died that we might escape the cross. On the other hand, he died that we might come on the cross with him. This, theologians tell us, is the including moral side of the law and of his death. On the one, excluding and judicial the death of Jesus Christ, that we might be absolved from our guilt and condemnation. And on the other side, his death that we might become partakers of his death, being involved in his crucifixion. This is what the apostle is saying when he declares, I am crucified with Christ. This is the obligation of Golgotha. We are planted together with the crucified one and associated organically with the likeness of his death. Paul is writing to the Roman church in chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also 
in the likeness of his resurrection. On the one hand, there is a fall of gloom that hangs over the heads of, of every individual to think that we have to go through the experience of death and crucifixion, but by the same token, immediately following that, if we have been planted with Christ in his death, uh, in his burial, so we shall also be planted with him in his glorious resurrection. And every individual who takes the crucifixion of the cross of Jesus Christ has burning and pulsating within him the blessed hope of that glorious resurrection day. Hallelujah. You know what that ought to do? I'm not so sure it does in every case, but it ought to somehow cause each and every one of us to hang a little more loosely to the things of this world and to somehow not be so tremendously concerned with how this old world is going. Because this world is not our home. It is while we're here and we have an obligation to levy the heavenly upon us to make it the best possible place it is as the salt of the earth. But someday we're going to leave it. And we're going to inherit something that is incorruptible and undefiled and fades not away. Bless God, this is the blessed hope that throbs within the heart of every born-again child of God. Amen. Therefore, we become followers or cross-bearers of Jesus Christ. I read in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, that he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now, I think a word needs to be said here concerning the meaning of cross-bearing. What is meant by bearing a cross? In my pastoral ministry, I have had some of the most dear and precious saints of the Lord God who have suffered physical afflictions. They have suffered distresses unimaginable. And I have seen and heard them stand in our worship services and give a testimony that to them was a testimony of victory. They were saying how they were going through this deep water of trial and affliction, and then a light broke upon their face, and they said, well, it just is my cross, and I'll bear it and go on with the Lord. And usually everybody said, amen, because it sounded good. Well, it does sound good when people resolve that regardless of what comes in their life, they purpose to go with the Lord God. That is good news. I enjoy hearing that. I don't care how they say it. You can butcher the king's English if you wish, but the meaning is the important thing. But I want you to notice here that bearing and enduring our afflictions and our infirmities and our sicknesses and our distresses is not bearing our cross. Follow me carefully here. The cross of Jesus Christ was something he could have laid down at any given time had he so chosen. He could have called 10,000 angels to his side to have liquidated all of his enemies. He was not going through something over which he had absolutely no control at all. No, no, the cross of Jesus Christ was not something that was laid upon him against his will and he just had to patiently endure it. No, no. The language of the scripture is, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame, suffering and pain, and willingly shouldered that cross and marched triumphantly to Golgotha. Though the language of the scriptures give us that he broke under the excruciating pain and weight of it, but there was a drive within his heart that said, I am doing the will of my heavenly Father, and this is a ransom for all the teeming multitudes of every age of the earth, and I am doing it with joy, for the joy that was set before him. And the emphasis is he could have laid it down any time he had chosen. Now what I'm asking tonight is, when we consider our cross-bearing, 
What is it that we have shouldered? What is it that we have taken upon ourselves uh, solely for the sake of our discipleship, of our relationship to the Lord God, that at any given time, if we so choose, we can lay it down? Now, my cross may be different than yours. Yours may be far different from your neighbor's. But to bear a cross is to shoulder something upon which receives the stamp of approval of God, and we take that in his honor, in his name, and endure whatever are the consequences for the sake of our relationship to him. The meaning of cross-bearing. So you see, the Lord says, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. That's in the negative. We can put that in the positive, my friends. For those individuals who will resolutely and with purpose shoulder the cross of Jesus Christ and say, As for me, this is the direction of my life. Come what may, I am committed to this. Lord God says, you become worthy, and you have my grace, and my strength, and my power. In this sense, we become corns of wheat, as he was. In John chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. We are called upon to share the precious foundation of our own redemption. That's a unique thing. What the Apostle Paul is saying when he declares, I am crucified with Christ, can be summed up in a world in a word like this. The world around us is dead through the crucified one. Now he's writing the Galatian church in chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now we go to the translators for a clarification of that verse. And the translators give this to us, that the world is a dead thing to me, and I am a dead man as far as the world is concerned. You say, preacher, that's that's mighty strong. <laughs> well, it's not the preacher that's doing this. This is the scripture that's saying this. And for us to reckon the world around us as dead, and for us to reckon ourselves as dead in relationship to the world, don't you see what that does? That, in a sense, puts us out of reach of much of the vicious grasp of the world that would reach out and take us. Now, I am, I am extremely careful here not to boast, because I read in scriptures that the man who boasts better be careful lest that boast turns to chaff and he stumbles and falls and he has to eat the words of his boast. So I don't mean it as a boast. I am giving honor and glory to the Lord. There are some areas of this old world's enticement that absolutely have no attraction for me whatsoever. I couldn't care less. It matters not to me one whit. Why? There's no virtue of my own, I assure you. But when a crucifixion has taken place, a crucifixion involves a death. And when the world around us is reckoned as a dead thing, and when we, as far as the world is concerned, are reckoned as dead individuals, there's just no claim on us. There's no attraction, there's no enticement. 
punishment there whatsoever. I want us to look what was Paul's world. This world was a moral world which had turned cosmos into chaos by selfish and self-glorifying misuse of God's good earth. Paul's world was the world of the Epicurean and the Pharisee as well. His world was the world of the best as well as the worst, especially when that best led to trust in self instead of trust in God. What was Paul saying about his world? He was saying that Jewish rights and Gentile vanities are equally insipid to me. I know them all to be empty and worthless. If Jews and Gentiles despise me, I despise that which they trust in. Their objects of dependence are as vile and execrable to me as I am to them. He rejected worldly wisdom, he rejected worldly riches, he rejected worldly honors, he rejected self-righteousness, he rejected splendor of gifts. He had privileges as a Jew. His birth was even of small consequence to him as a result of his being crucified with Christ. That's a strong statement to me when he mentioned the world is crucified. Not only is Paul saying, I am crucified, but he's exper experiencing now that the world itself is a crucified thing. By this we infer and we mean that its character is condemned. John chapter 12 verse 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. That speaks of the condemnation of this present order. The world as we know it. Its judgment is disdained. For with the execution of judgment passed upon the world, who cares for the opinion of an executed criminal? Not much. And so the opinions of the world, what are they against the concepts of Jesus Christ? And yet so many times we are moved and swayed by the opinions of the world. Why do we allow ourselves to become moved and influenced by a condemned criminal, doomed for execution? No, the world should not hold any sway whatsoever over the redeemed and ransomed and crucified child of God. His teachings are despised. What authority can teachings have like that? His pleasures, his honors, his treasures are rejected. His pursuits, his maxims, his spirits are cast out. His threatenings and blandishments are made nothing of. <laughs> For itself is soon going to pass away. The world around us. Oh, it causes us so much problems, doesn't it? Paul says, as far as I'm concerned, it's dead. And as far as it's concerned, I'm dead. The world around me is a crucified thing. When Paul says, I am a crucified with Christ, he is also stating that the world within me is crucified. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. I read in verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> Once again, the translators help us here. This we know, that our old self, why the peasant, was nailed to the cross with him. When Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, he is saying that that inner nature, that inner man, that inner world that was so antagonistic to the things of God and to the things of the Spirit and to the Lord of the being, his damnation and ruin, he said that was nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. Philip says, it, let us never forget that our old selves died with him on the cross. The New English Bible gives it to us. We know that the man we once were. What kind of a person were you? What kind of a person are you? We know that our, the man we once were has been crucified with Christ. That ought to be the most glorious news anyone could hear. Now, I'm not going to reveal everything, but I'm going to tell you that uh, if you had known what sort of individual I was before I am what I am, I seriously doubt it. You would think this service was much worth enjoying. But 
I'm so thankful that there was provisions. And don't look so smug, because if we go back in the past of the rest of you, you'd probably have to confess the same too. <coughs> I see you back there. <coughs> but look, <laughs> all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what I'm suggesting here is to know that that self has been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ is a magnificent truth. The old man, the flesh with its affections and lusts, the indwelling sin infection of our natures. Oh, my friends, the design of God is to counterwork and destroy the very spirit and soul of sin. That it shall no longer, that we shall no longer serve it. That is, no longer be its slaves. We are to die as truly unto sin as he did for sin. Anything less is sub-Christian. Life surrounded by forces of sin is to be marked by complete moral antipathy to them. A conclusive breach with sin. Christ's physical crucifixion has its moral equivalent in our death to sin. Putting to death within us the instincts and impulses which war against God's will. I've mentioned before there's no claim on a dead man. And death ends all counts against him. He is dead. That particular man is beyond our reach, for good or evil. And this is the kind of answer we should give to the claim of sin. When sin tries to attach and fasten a claim to us, we can look it right in the eye and say, No way! I am crucified with Christ! And as far as you're concerned, sin, I am a dead man. You have no claim on me. about to get blessed. <laughs> we have died with Christ. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we are, so far as sin is concerned, to regard ourselves as dead men. I mean by that we do not respond to its suggestions, we are not answerable to its demands, we live in a world where its writ does not run and where its power is infinite. The first step is in passing beyond the influence of sin, is to know that we have passed out of its kingdom and always to regard ourselves in that light. Now this is a painful crucifixion. I'm not going to tell you it is. For our Lord truly suffered. And sin struggles awfully, even in the best of men, especially our besetting sins or our constitutional sins. Oh, one man is proud. What prayers and tears it costs him to bring the neck of old pride to the block. Another might be greedy. And how he has to lament because his gold or wealth will corrode within his soul. Some are guilty of a murmuring spirit. And it is no easy thing to conquer a spirit of contention. Have you ever tried in your own strength? I think if anything, it takes the grace of God in a superabundant way to conquer these spirits of contention. Yet, cost what it may, anything in our lives, it does not measure up to the standard of God must be brought to the crucifying cross. The world within us must be crucified. How can we expect to live with him unless we die like him? I would dare to suggest this evening that as the Apostle Paul stands and says, I am crucified with Christ, he also means the world beneath us is dead. I read in his letter to the Colossian church, chapter 2, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Oh, if you could catch the glimpse and the image of what this is saying, if I could somehow have the graphics up here for you to see what is being portrayed in that verse, it would probably send tingles of excitement through your very fibers. For it says, he disarmed the principalities and the powers which fought against him. He took their armaments away. He rid himself of all the powers of evil. The hostile princes and rulers he stripped off from himself. 
He made of them an open example, celebrating a triumph over them thereby. I like the way Lightfoot puts it. Christ took upon himself our human nature with all of its temptations. The powers of evil gathered about him. Again and again they assailed him, but each fresh assault ended in a new defeat. And in the wilderness he was tempted by Satan, but Satan retired for a time, baffled and defeated. Through the voice of his chief disciple, the temptation was renewed, and he was tempted to decline the appointed sufferings and death. Satan was driven off. Then the last hour came, and this was the great crisis of all, when the power of darkness made itself felt, when the prince of this world asserted his tyranny. The final act of the conflict began with the agony of Gethsemane and ended on the cross of Calvary, and friends, the victory was complete. The enemy of man was defeated. The powers of evil, which had clung like a Mises robe about his humanity, were torn off and cast aside forever. And the victory of man is involved in the victory of Christ. I want you to hear that. Your victory tonight is involved in the victory of Jesus Christ. In his death, we too are divested of the poisonous, clinging garments of temptation and sin and death. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. This is the kind of power and victory we can have. Well, what does this say to us in the 20th century? Well, it says that if Christ has spoiled Satan, let us not be afraid to meet him. If he accuses you, we can reply, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If he condemns you, you can ask, who is he that condemneth? If he threatens you to divide you, you can shout, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And if he lets loose sin with the death, if he lets loose sin upon us, we can dash the hell dogs aside with, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Same provision have been made, my friend, for each and every one of us. If death should threaten you, we can exclaim, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Your battle shall turn to your advantage. And I have good news for you, that the more numerous they are, the greater will be your spoil. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, how sweet to know. I am crucified with Christ. The cross of Christ forever remains the emblem of a virtuous and a victorious Christ. It shall ever be the sole means of access to God and Christian discipleship. And the implications of this are very severe. There is no hope of salvation aside from a crucifixion. Paul's assertion, I am crucified with Christ, has strong personal implications. And any attempt to reach heaven by passing the crucifixion will be met with defeat. May I say it as gently and as tenderly as I know. I'm afraid there are some good people that are going to miss it. For the simple reason, they have not had a personal crucifixion. We might have the best of intentions. We might desire the greatest amount of good. I wouldn't be surprised, I can't judge here, but it wouldn't surprise me if there might be those even working in the church. But no crucifixion. They have not as yet done in this category, we are still under the old economy. The handwriting and ordinances are still against us. There is no genuine life because there has been no death. But oh, I have good news for you. The cross is open to all who wish to come and seek life that is available through death. Paul goes on to say, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but 
reflected on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, listen to it, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Set your affection. That's the admonition and that's the challenge. The Greek word interprets that word affection as mind. Set your mind. The shades of meaning in that one word. It means to exercise the mind, to entertain or to have an opinion, to be mentally disposed in a certain direction, to interest oneself. The power to do this is discovered in verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. As the orchestra builds to its climax, so the symphony of heaven reaches its apex with the glorious strains of the promise. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Vocabulary fails to adequately describe what that means. But that's the blessed hope that we possess. Why? Because we can be crucified with Christ. Would you stand to your feet, please, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Alice is going to play. The Holy Spirit is going to minister. Once again, the invitation will be given. Once again, it will not be a lengthy begging or pleading. An opportunity is extended. If have you have been sitting through this service, as you've been feeling the vibrations of the Spirit of God. And as we examine our own hearts tonight in the light of, has there been a crucifixion? If you'd like to become included in that, and to be recipients of all the grand and glorious provisions that are resulted upon being crucified with Christ, if you'd like to close this service with a season of prayer here at the altar, I invite you to come. Alita is going to sing. As she does, would you mind, God? Alita. <laughs> 